Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Inside Scoop episode 26 this week. We're having Oscar as a co-host again. Hey, Oscar. Hey, hey. And a special guest, Megan. Hi. Hi there. Megan's joining us from Toronto, I think, or am I mistaken? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Toronto, Ontario, yes. A, a far, far away place, but diversity of opinions. That's what we're after. Um, so... When we've chatted last time, I was thinking about rules. And then I think our last podcast, Oscar, was about Socrates and the ignorance. And uh, I like the, the beautiful segue that when we had a little chat with Megan, she uh, said sort of Socrates is questioning, what is it, the, the people's life of in the Athens or something, isn't it? Yeah, so he's he's questioning uh, the the democracy that exists in Athens, uh, their political system, but also their everyday beliefs and and the rules that they build on top of those beliefs. So their their beliefs about things like love and citizenship, uh, and he's challenging them to uh, look beyond those rules. At, at those values and, and whether there there is actually valid knowledge mm -hmm. uh yeah that that underwrites those beliefs are those um, rules sort of like uh i don't know a, a thing that was written like you know the the hammurabi or whatever codex what what was the i don't even remember what it's called you know like some yeah, sort the of a, code, yeah. yeah the code which which is like the like legit rules which are in, engraved or are these more of a mental uh things that people create for themselves do you think so it's a it's a bit of both socrates was a pretty ambitious guy uh, and and so it it is the political uh system that they had uh in in athens and uh that includes a lot of the, the laws they had written uh, but but it, it's also just some of their their ways of life and Socrates was presenting questions about those things not even his own beliefs just uh, asking questions um, and you know as we were talking about before Socrates is eventually executed um, he's, he's tried and executed for or questioning these things that people hold so dear and uh oh, yeah. so you're you're right it's a great segue into i was into gonna ask about actually because it feels like what era was it, it was kind of well a long time ago wasn't it so like 400 bc yeah. 400 bc it feels like he should have been killed and you know executed for for questioning the the system or something but then yeah as you mentioned I just, you know, learned that, yeah, he was actually executed. So my theory was correct <laughs> that he's kind of, you know, going against the flow and then whatever, you know, people who yeah. go against the flow, they just, just get rid of them because, you know, it, it serves, it, it is a disservice for the system, I guess. Yeah. So he, he was actually charged for the moral corruption of Athenian youth and impiety, um, with impiety is 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 a word they use to um, to talk about sort of unfaithfulness to to their theology, um, and and so they they thought he didn't have enough respect for um, their their religion and everything that they held sacred in Athens. And wow. uh, what did you say? Moral moral corruption, corruption. of the Athenian youth. And and that I think a lot of historians believe comes from the fact that th there were a lot of youth that were were fans of Socrates and uh, would kind of follow him around as he uh, took on um, some of the big players in Athenian government and law, uh, and and he would he would talk to them in the streets and um, he would draw a crowd and. Uh, in a way, embarrass a lot of these important people because they weren't, in the end, able to defend the rules that they set for all of Athens. That's kind of cool, isn't it? It's like a, a, having a 
childlike passion for something. It's like, you know, when a child just continues asking the same thing over and over again, which is why the best question ever. Like, I think we I actually think we, we lose this ability to question when we age, unless we practice this. I don't know if you've ever, yeah, if you've seen any such a situation where your child is just like, why? And then you say, well, it's because, well, it's like that, you know, <laughs> like I, I've, yeah. I was asked by, by one little kid, why do you have long hair? Boys don't have long hair. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I just started laughing. Like, what do I answer? <laughs> like, what, how do I, how do I, you know, tell him? It's like, well, I don't know. Don't, don't cut your hair. It's going to grow the same way. But like, and then he just keeps, keeps asking why. And maybe also there's a hidden thing with this question. It's like he was also imposed this by someone else because, well, well, who actually says that boys have to have short hair or long hair? Or, you know, who tells women to have long hair? That's also a thing. Like, where does this rule come from? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think uh, I think that you're right in that kids do do a lot of questioning. Uh, and it's, uh, it's sort of unfortunate that, uh, it, it stops at that. And that, uh, as, as we grow up, I think, uh, perhaps in certain people's life trajectories, they, they stop questioning things. Um, and that's unfortunate because it's, it's when you stop questioning things and, uh, thinking deeply about things, uh, that you, become vulnerable to uh, people sort of dictating your life. Yeah. And uh, maybe Oscar can step in with the, cause I'm not, again, I don't know much about the Socratic ignorance thing. Is it, uh, could you remind quickly what it, what it was from, I think the last episode, right? You always scare me when you say that. <laughs> maybe Oscar can step in and say something. <laughs> well, that's uh, something. I mean, I'm, I'm, I remember that cause you know, yeah. where I'm coming from is, is, is a sort of, we find ourselves in situations where we're acting in, in a specific way, but because we've always acted in such a way, we, not so we don't even know how to break out of it. We don't know that we are in it, right? It's, it's like when you're, when you're in, in, in the flow, uh, in the river, for example, you, you just don't need to do anything and the water is just carrying you. So if you, don't again as as a child if you don't question you know why and what's happening around you you're not even going to probably realize that the direction in which the river is taking you is probably not actually the, the direction in which you should be going or where you want to right. be going so i mean that is something we brought up also in the last episode of uh when you're growing up until maybe like your late teens or mid teens you don't kind of pay attention, you don't reflect on yourself, so you are just kind of flowing with whatever, the environment, letting it shape you, and all mm -hmm. of that. You don't reflect upon yourself. Yeah. But, so Socratic ignorance? But do you want to, you want me to talk about Socratic ignorance? At least a bit, because I've, I've been <laughs> called out on this too. It's like, oh, so you don't even know what it means? It's like, uh, yeah, I guess <laughs> Um, Who called you out on that? Well, even you did <laughs> when, I, when I used to talk about, uh, what is it like? What are the terms? Being ignorant? Being, hmm. uh, what was that? Oh, that was... Uh, anyway. Let's... A lot of arguing about definitions of things and connotations. So. Oh, yeah. But I'm not even sure anymore that I know what Socratic ignorance is. But I feel like it's uh, just the fact of... In, say social situations it is hard to know or even impossible to know an absolute truth um mm. in subjective matters anyway yeah, yeah. Mm. so about as much as i could say maybe megan knows something about Socratic <laughs> ignorance oh, i heard you, you you're a philosophy minor that's sick yeah yeah i mean i i don't know too much about socratic ignorance but i, I think w one thing that we can bring into the conversation uh if we're talking about uh socrates is that he he really truly believed that he he knew nothing uh but the fact that he at least could recognize in himself that he didn't know anything already put him a step above uh, the the other Athenians in his mind because 
they wrongly believed that they they knew something about the world. Um, so if you if you read his his dialogues, it's it's all about him just asking questions. He's uh, he's not really proposing anything new to replace the the beliefs of the Athenians, yep. but he's just he's he's making them uh, take a second look at at, at their rules. And, yeah. and so he calls himself the wisest man, sort of tongue in cheek. He calls himself the wisest man in Athens, just because he can recognize that he doesn't have the information and he's willing to do that work to to get to a place where he might have some semblance of knowledge. Yeah, it's like really being a child. Yeah, <laughs> Children don't know anything. They're born and then they literally just like see the world for the first time ever. But they're not afraid to admit it. They're just walking around just saying, why, why, why? <laughs> like pointing at, <laughs> at, at stuff and just ask like, what is this? What is this? And you have to repeat like five times. It's still like, what is this? <laughs> I don't know. I was going with a, with a smaller, like a younger sister. And yeah, it, it's like, it's nice to see someone like form and grow and then just be curious so i think the curiosity is something that we lack but yeah but i guess coming back to the topic of rules and and sort of self-imposed ones i don't know who creates rules in the first place anyone yeah well i think it, it gets even more complicated when you realize that a lot of the rules that govern what we do and how how we act uh, are not written down anywhere um so it, it's it's hard to trace the the lineage of those rules um mm. right so uh with laws we can we can look back in history and we can see the context from where they came from but for example uh what you were saying marius about uh about things like gender rules those mm. those are rules that are are um sort of written with in ourselves within our being because uh, we've we've been taught that over and over and over, um, but yeah. those are I think the harder ones to question. Oh yeah, those are like very difficult ones because then even for example, um, well I've heard you know incidents like uh, Disney princesses for example. There's no black Disney princess or uh, again maybe now it's you know stuff's <laughs> changing but the the thing is. So what happens is children sort of read those books or whatever Disney is these days, you know, like, what is it, like animation and, well, whatever, right? So they create these beautiful worlds which children are immersed in, and then whatever they see, they just accept as the absolute truth almost because they, they just don't know better. They, they've never seen something else, and they're probably, you know, not yet evolve to a point like they are internally motivated to ask why 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 but sometimes some things just do, just seem obvious and and i think that's a very dangerous time to to be uh for a child to be young because well first of all <clears throat> you have the curiosity to always ask why, ask why. but then you're slowly forming this conservative views because anytime you ask something or, or whatever your parents are gonna just you know show you the right way and then you start accepting that your parents are like the authority figure and then whatever they say is the right way to do and then by parenting our children i guess this way we're sort of i don't want to say like dumbing dumbing down but it's really feels like we're exhausting their curiosity slowly yeah, it's, it's interesting thought. that <laughs> one of the main uh, takeaways from that uh, prior conversation is just we need to have a, a little bit more childlike curiosity mm -hmm. in us, right? And and we need to have that uh, that urge to question things. Uh, and another thing you brought up is uh, is Disney. It's important to remember how much uh, media plays into our our understanding of of what the world looks like and what the rules of the world looks like so yeah absolutely uh if you think about uh, sort of the lack of representation of diversity mm -hmm. in uh media especially especially for children 
uh, and you compare that to, to what the world looks like, uh, there's, there's a disconnect there. Um, and I think for, for children to not see themselves in the movies and the books and the TV shows that they love, um, you've got a message being sent, maybe not necessarily a rule, but a message being sent that they're not, not fit to, to be in these roles. Right. Yeah. It, it probably such things then create some sort of un, you know untold rules because as we said like the again the codex i believe had something to do with for example a carpenter or someone who builds a house for a person mm-hmm. and if the house falls down and crushes the the owner then you know the person who built the house has to be also like crushed with a rock or something like that and it's very simple it's written down it's a rule like they created it and maybe you know people agreed on it or maybe because it it's not democracy i don't know what you know happened back in those days but someone said it and then people follow it but i'm i'm also interested in in like how do we form those sort of implicit rules where we uh, it feels like we f- again forget to question them i guess but so i guess as i mentioned before right i was born in lithuania i was i grew up there and it's a very non-diverse culture i guess mm-hmm. it's like i don't know if i could draw a graph but it would be probably like 99.9 percent, just like everyone almost you know the same same race same everything so it's kind of hard because I think I even mentioned before, and even like sexuality, if someone asked you, are you gay? <laughs> That's supposed to mean like the the huge and like the worst insult ever, because you, sh- you should feel like, oh, oh, no, I'm not gay. Like, how dare you, you know? It's like, but at the same time, right, it, it's, it's just the thing that is maybe like normal and, and now it's like accepted and I don't know. And it, it, yeah. it, it, it kind of, you form these like, yeah, I don't know how, how like you grew up with like a different place and how it feels like around there, but yeah, it's been yeah weird. I'm in a I'm in Toronto, so it's it's quite quite diverse here. But I I definitely um, it's definitely interesting to to hear about how things are over there, and um, I, I mean I think the the good thing that we can draw is the fact that all of um, the the hatred that you talk about uh, that stems from a lack of diversity, it, that can be changed, right? Um, and it, it definitely is difficult uh, to to change things like that when when you don't have uh, a diverse community around you. But I think when we were talking about this earlier, uh, Oscar brought up uh, a video that he had seen on on Mm. facebook uh that educated him a a little bit more about uh a a racial slur but the internet is just a a fantastic resource to turn to now um and it it offers a lot of a lot of opportunities to um to educate people and uh to have conversations about how we are different and how we can approach those differences uh with with respect and compassion for each other it's interesting in the manner manner that is happening in eastern europe right now um because uk and then us us is even more progressive than the uk i think or maybe not uh but if you look at eastern europe they're quite far behind in terms of progressiveness i think that's a word right right? So, yeah, but yeah. now with globalization and when all of what, what happened in America, now that was so unprecedented that that's reaching Eastern Europe. I mean, there's protests about this stuff in Eastern Europe that nobody expected that at all. Like at least the UK, I didn't expect it to reach Europe, like Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. And so all this kind of diversity talk has started in Europe, I think, well, through that really. And it's, 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 quite different to the way it started i guess in the uk and the us where there is a lot of diversity so that kind of brought it on yeah Um, Yeah. because you don't you don't get a lot of diversity in 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 eastern europe really 
I don't yeah, know, I'm sure. I don't know why it's that. Maybe it's just because people. I don't know actually. Maybe it's just that they weren't so much involved in like conflicts or, or something that happened between the countries uh or maybe the hatred that everyone had just forced different people out because it, it sort of feels like you know you've been you've, you're being almost repeated constantly when you when you well me growing up there just saying be normal and that that thing like being normal like what do you mean by be normal but but the thing is I was never questioning it almost like it's everyone has to comply everyone has to be you know like a I don't know a, a chill chill person like don't don't do waves just go with the flow almost everyone just keeps saying that just be normal like what what is normal like it's it's quite different in different places and countries like it's just yeah. weird um and I mean I've been doing a little bit of of research about uh, education around diversity and, and one of the most important thing in terms of teaching children to respect diversity is exposure to diversity. So you definitely see how, mm. um, how not being able to see, uh, different kinds of people around you, uh, will, will slow some of that social change. For yeah. sure. Like, I think it took me quite a while to actually, see the other side um like even the uh sexuality side for example i think i only sat down and actually had a like a conversation with homosexual people when i was when was it like last year actually i think so it's just like legit recently like i've been you know 20 years living and never being exposed to, to different things like that and it's good to educate self and realize that man we actually don't know much about it and just so weird yeah because it feels like these aren't really like rules per se but but that there's some preconceived stuff that we create for ourselves i guess like subconsciously just put these little i don't even know you know I mean, it's curious to think where this morality, I guess you could call it, comes from the, our morals. Uh, which are these kind of rules that you're describing of that are unwritten, but we all kind of are tending towards them, uh, tending to be t towards being more accepting and yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and I used to tie it back to, to Socrates, um, ignorance about about these rules is is dangerous and um can and in the past has resulted in in a lot of violence right mm -hmm. um so it, it just feels like a feels like a social responsibility to continue looking at the the beliefs and that you that you hold and wondering if uh if there's really basis for them so uh yeah, thinking about like, for example, homophobia. That that stuff is 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 taught from somewhere, but it 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 definitely takes unlearning after it's been taught, right? Yeah, I guess once you realize that, like, wait, what is this? Like, why? You know, maybe the yeah. the education. I mean, I guess that that's the first the first step to everything, uh, even. I've had quite quite an interesting conversation today about people be uh, having because uh, we were observing how many single mom, mom, mothers, for example, exist, and and how maybe like some countries have more of them, less, and so it, well, it's besides the point. But it's it's thinking about. The where does this all start? It's probably education, because if people were well educated about what happens, uh, I don't know if you if you act unresponsibly and irresponsibly, and then you end up in such situations where people just you know divorce and 
legit i've seen people like 19 years old and just already with a child and already divorced like how how is the person going to contribute to the society now it's like all of the efforts are going to be to like obviously you know raise a child and everything but it feels like instead of educating self before you can grow up uh, you know like right r- r- i don't know like raise up the child and, and educate that child it feels like you first have to like get over the step of educating yourself and all that so it's i think everything just ties back nicely into education itself like it, that's where you have to start isn't it because i think you megan mentioned that this is what happens like you you get educated like that and then later in life you don't even question it because well you got taught this way and and then you you were also taught that you have to listen to teachers and everything so it's like you know whatever teacher says that's the right way and then you sort of don't even think about it yeah i i think um in in order for us to uh to look back on the uh, rules, the explicit or implicit rules that that we follow, and and to question those, we need to be actively seeking out different perspectives, uh, and and perhaps talking to people who don't agree with us, uh, and and having those discussions. True. Yeah. So I think this also continuing on uh, ties interestingly into discipline and sort of self-discipline self self i don't know imposed rules i guess um, is i think once you realize that those rules weren't created by someone who is you know smarter than you sort of and you you're like you can you can just as nicely like as properly as understand what what's right what's wrong then you well, not even that, maybe even like self-discipline, right? Which says like, I'm not going to eat, you know, ice cream or I'm not going to eat so much sugar or something like that. Uh, do you think that's the next step to like, once you realize that rules aren't like some, you know, holy thing, then you just, you can bend them, create your own ones. Um, yeah. Well, I think in the, in the context of what we were, we were speaking of uh, in the context of sort of, questioning rules especially when it uh comes to our our beliefs about about different people i think it does take a certain amount of discipline and commitment to unlearn those those rules uh especially deeply embedded ones um so i i think it that takes time and that takes energy and in order to commit that time and energy you need to to dedicate yourself to it and then i think there um is sort of a recognition as you grow older that uh in order to achieve goals that you set for yourself you also you also need to impose certain certain rules on yourself yeah. what do you guys think when is it okay to break rules like i don't know any sort of rules i guess Anyone has anything to like step in with? Hmm. It's because I I was listening to some some stuff today where the person said, "When you know better." That's sort of like, is it okay to break rules, or like, when is it okay to break rules? And the answer is almost like, when you know better. When you can get away with it. <laughs> ah, that's an interesting perspective. Maybe when well, it doesn't impact or it, it's not to a detriment of someone else? I mean, once you realize rules aren't a holy thing and, you know, somebody decided them somewhere and they, they're not fixed throughout the time, then you kind of have to figure out if you can, you know, which which rules do you follow and which ones you want to break. You kind of have to decide on your own morality. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, you mentioned something quickly, Marius, that's definitely a consideration that that i use when i'm thinking about rules to uphold or rules to break which is just like what impact are are my actions going to have on other people uh because part of realizing that these these rules have been created and that these rules can be broken and re reshaped and rethought is is also recognizing that uh 
you have a responsibility to other people to, I mean, at the least, at the minimum, not harm them. Yeah. Right. Um, and that, uh, you know, we're, we're all part of this, this global community. And, you know, sometimes you, you are going to cause harm, but it, in every way possible, trying, trying to avoid that. Uh, so that's, that, I mean, that's part of my morality and it's, uh, yeah. It's a sort of a guiding principle when you when you evaluate rules, and everyone's going to have different guiding principles there. But mm. probably think try to avoid unnecessary harm because it's really quite hard to avoid any harm at all to anybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially you know when we think about harm as physical very often, but as we kind of stigmatize and get rid of physical harm and get rid of wars, which is what we always talk about and what we always want to get rid of we kind of forget about all the psychological wars we have between each other in the workplace or whatever. Um, so, so that exists. That's a, and then we don't, we don't really talk about that or not even the workplace. I mean, everyday life, we're all trying to kind of compete against each other in some way, which can cause psychological harm. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's something you can get rid of, but definitely try to avoid unnecessary harm. If you can define yeah. it, yeah, it's hard. I think to imagine a, a world without harm because we're all complex beings engaged in really complicated relationships with each other. Um, but yeah, perhaps reimagining a, a society in which um, we can lessen that harm. Um, so, for example, can we reimagine a society where things are not built on competition but rather cooperation mm, yeah. yeah i spent much of my first year at university thinking about the purpose of competition mm-hmm. and whether it's necessary and so i came to the conclusion that it is so <laughs> but i would have to go cast my mind back to then that was a long time ago mm. to think about that I guess but it does, what do you guys think? It doesn't make sense, at least at least somewhat. That's for sure, because there's loads of loads of interesting debates about, for example, communism or you know some sort of a a system which it doesn't really motivate you too much. Um, it, it's where where sort of you're given everything, but at the same time you have just as much as your neighbor has doesn't matter what your uh effort level is so then people start to realize that oh it doesn't matter if i if i do good work or don't do good work i'm gonna get paid the same i'm gonna have the same car i'm gonna have the same apartment really doesn't matter so then people sort of lose lose hope and and i guess uh, they don't want to push harder anymore at least that's what I've heard about about especially communism. That's just the only theory that I had right now. But yeah, I, I mean, I I don't think I've done a lot of uh, thinking about uh, what this might look like on a national scale. Um, because personally, to me, it just feels so big and so major, and um, sometimes just so unattainable. But like, what does it look like in our personal lives in our local communities to uh work on a cooperative model uh sometimes instead of a competitive one right um Mm -hmm. and so that can play out um in in all sorts of ways um but sort of on a local governance level like um what is it i mean it, it it already plays itself out in things like um local community gardens and local yeah. community grants right um, yeah i like it. i like what you actually say yeah i don't think i've, I've thought about it this way cooperation because if because when when oscar you said about like should we do we need competition i was thinking like well if we if there's no competition what else but right mm-hmm. there's co- cooperation Right. I mean, you have it together with competition. You have a mix of both of them at all times. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting because you do get communes and communities that do kind of follow the 
kind of communist communist way of you know we share everything that we reap and but those are like small communities and that's kind of interesting that it can work but yeah absolutely those do exist those do exist well damn well that's that's kind of an interesting conversation where we are over 30 minutes and uh I think we've done well. If you guys think there's some more topics we could uh, explore, is there anything? I think we could talk uh, forever about this, but I, I also think that we, we put a lot of uh, really good insights on the table. Yeah, so keep it uh, keep it quality over quantity, I guess. But damn, I've learned something new too. It's like the co- cooperation thing. Yeah, I've never never really thought about that. Right, like. Even think, thinking about gaming or like playing some games, I I really never enjoyed competition all too much. I like, and I've even heard you know quotes like they say when when you're doing something. Well, this this is you know coming back to competition, obviously, but when you want to build something and compete with people, build the biggest building in town, but don't try to tear down other people's buildings like you know when when someone tries to compete with people they they have two choices it's either if they want to have the tallest building they can either build it or they can tear everyone else's buildings down so but that's a weird tangent but yeah coming back to it i think i enjoy cooperative cooperative games more than competitive i guess like yeah. even such yeah, a I- mundane example about like gaming but still <laughs> It, it, I mean, it. it shows that um, there are other things that can motivate you beyond competition, right? Even in the, that that micro example. Yeah, right. I never never really thought about it. Yeah, yeah that's kind of cool. <laughs> anyway, so technically, every time—well, not really every time—we sort of fell out of this habit, but every time we end, used to end on a sentence, which is a like a beautiful sentence that would sum up and give the the podcast the beautiful wrap-up meaning a takeaway maybe megan could bring some fresh insights what do you think could be a beautiful sentence to sum up this whole thing um does that to me every time uh, (laughs) i think a a good one just would just be to to keep learning right uh it's sort of a a theme that went throughout our entire conversation, but um, we're we're lost if we if we stop stop mm. learning. So, yeah. If you don't want to get lost, keep learning and keep realizing that you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Well, I think I think that's that. That's a cool. A cool conversation. Thanks, Oscar. Thanks, Megan, and thanks everybody for listening. I guess see y'all later. All right, thank you. See you.